I've put it into three parts, what we do before a session, what happens during an actual session, and what happens afterwards. And I thought it was quite uh, apropos because today is our 70th birthday. It turns out this is the 70th uh, Zoom session we've had, our 70th weekly session since COVID. And we'll be looking to say at the content, the hardware and the software, starting with the content. I'm convinced that there's virtually every member who's watching today or uh, and other members have got something to offer. I know that lots of people say, oh, I, I can't do a talk or what I've got is not significant or whatever. But if you talk to people individually over the phone or in person, you discover they've got lots of little ideas. And my plan is to try and get um, that content out of them. So let's look at the, the before, the preparation that goes into this. The biggest job we've got is organised material from members. We've been pretty lucky so far, as you can see there, we've had 19 members uh, local members plus two others who've actually made talks and presentations at the, the West of Scotland uh, Zoom sessions. And there's three more uh, on the agenda for the future. So we've been quite lucky. And even better, there's nobody that, that I've spoken to and asked who've actually said that they wouldn't do it. So those who haven't done it yet, you know who's coming for you next. Uh, so what we're trying to do is make sure that we can help them. So the content they provide can be varied. Like next week, we've got a, a presentation again from uh, Gordon <clears throat> that only contains photographs he's taken and a couple of video clips. We don't have to go into uh, bigger projects. If you're doing a bigger project, say for uh, one of these full sessions, you might want to have schematics of what you've designed or used, block diagrams of how things work. But you don't have to have that large array you see there before you're able to make a presentation. Just showing something in your hand, describing it, or even better, a photograph so we can make it full screen and you can describe what goes on. So once we've got that, we have to work out some sort of order. Somebody comes to me, and this happened a good few times now, here are my videos, here are my images, and we work out what's the best way to present it to members. What's the most logical uh, order that you'd want to present those ideas as it progresses? And once we've worked out that order, they can either make a presentation in the, in the sense of a PowerPoint, or it could simply be a slideshow that we show via sharing the screen. We don't have to have fancy hardware or software to allow us to make that presentation. And if you haven't done it before, I've had quite a few uh, times when members have come on and we made a practice session. They come on and use Zoom to make sure they're familiar with how they share a screen or how they present stuff. So there's plenty of support, both in terms of the content itself and how to present it and having a practice. So don't feel that you're on your own if you want to volunteer for something, you'll get plenty of support from us here. Now the photographs that you want to produce, I don't have to go into this in great detail, there's various sources, you've all either got an existing camera or a camera that's built into your phone, or a webcam that can, you're able to take images with. So any project you're working on and want to show to members, you can take as many images as you think are useful to, to get the ideas over. Or you might want to capture stuff from a website. So as you know, in the past, we've said, look, here's a, a commercial product that does such and such and here's our interpretation of it. So I want to start with something we've snipped from uh, a website. 
And Windows provides a snipping tool. That's the old one you see just above my head. And there's now a new one called uh, Snip and Sketch, which gives you a bit more flexibility. You'll see there that there's a little clock above me called Delay. And that's because if you have a pull down menu and then you move into snipping, the, the, the menu just disappears again. So what you have to do is click Delay, get the pull down menu, and then the screen's frozen with that pull down on it. You're able to capture the whole thing. So let's just look at uh, the snip and sketch. Right, here's an example of using Windows own uh, snip and sketch tool. So we can hit the Windows local key, the shift key, and the S key. And up pops the menu at the top, where I can pull out a rectangular area an irregular shape, I can pull out an individual window from a monitor, if there's more than one window on the monitor, or I can take the entire full screen of, of the monitor. Let's look at the free form. All I have to do is go around the area that I want to save. It's now saved to the clipboard. Right, so the only thing I would say about clipping images is beware of any copyright infringements that you might uh, come across. But barring that, you're able to take images and add it into your presentation. This is moving uh, up one place from that, where you've designed something yourself, or you've used an image, a, a, a schematic that you found and you've modified, and you want to show that to the members. Above my head is the way I do it. I just use it in an ordinary graphics package, but you have design applications that you can download, TinyCAD there and TICAD there which you can simply pull down various icons and make connections between them and build up a, a schematic image that you can then use to show the members, saving it as a graphics file. Or fritzing, which I think people, some members already are using. Once again, you can pull down icons, plop them in the screen, when you put down all the, the uh, components, you can then join them all together. You can do more than that, this particular package, but I'm talking about making schematics at this point. There's more to it, for example, you can create a breadboard layout from that uh, schematic. You can even get a PCB from that schematic. So you're able, to, if you need to, to produce your own schematics for inclusion in your presentation. If you're not sure, again, we can help you with that one. If you want to create images from scratch, for example, there above my head, we have the EasyBus uh, system outlined. We can use uh, the graphics package that I showed you a moment ago. But for block diagrams, we can use something as simple as paint that comes with Windows. Or a bit upmarket, GIMP is very popular. So paint is bundled with Windows. GIMP is a, a free software. And then there's a couple of in between the professional packages and the free ones. You've got Coral one. I use Paint Shop Pro from Coral and Photoshop elements from Adobe. And they all give you varying uh, facilities. That's just paint from bundled with Windows itself. If you're not sure where to find it, just go into the search at the bottom left of your screen and type paint and up it'll pop. 
and you can do very basic shapes, as you can see there, and various fills. So it's, it's got some basic elements that, that can be used. If you want to go a bit, a bit further, then you can download, as you can see from GIMP.org, GIMP, which is pretty well featured package for, for being uh, free. And you can see there, I've pulled in some graphic images and I've uh, added to it some block images and some text and some lines and so on. And once again, you've got down the right hand side, your options for colors and textures if you wanted that. On your left hand side, you've got the various facilities that offers to draw lines, to add text and so on, to cut out pieces, to erase pieces and so on, to have flood fills. So it's all well featured there uh, for free. The one I use is Coral Paint Shop Pro. This because I'm used to it over the years. Uh, it does a lot more than what we would normally use because it'll do things like, you know, if you take photographs to enhance pictures to take away the, the lines in your face and take away red eye from photographs and all that, things that we probably wouldn't be using, but it's featured to do lots of things like that, multi layers and so on. But for simple uh, block diagrams, any of the ones I've mentioned are, are uh, available and useful. If you want to then edit an image, and that can be one you've made yourself and got a mistake, or it could be amending a, an image you've downloaded. Once again, you can use those four imaging applications, but you should be aware of the formats that you save them in. There's two main formats that we'll, we'll uh, mostly use. The JPEG is a must if you're using an image for a Zoom background. You can't put a GIF file as a background there, but it'll happily, GIFs can happily be used in PowerPoint. And as you'll see in, uh, in fact, I'm using one right now for OBS Studio. It's very worth spending just a minute on what the, the JPEG and GIF stands for. The JPEG works on Ratios of how much red, how much green, and how much blue is in, a, in an image, the RGB values. And you can set the, R, the red, the green, and the blue individually. So if that was full and that was zero and that was zero, it would be pure red. So got, that value can go from nothing up to 255, hence your 256 uh, options. Multiply all together, and that's where you end up with the famous 16.7 colors that you get in a JPEG. You can see an example here with the little icon I had at the beginning. You can see the mix. There's 137 is the value of the red, 20 for the green, 234 for the blue. The GIF on the other hand, doesn't have anything like that range. At any one time, I can only store 256 colors. It's called a clut, but it sounds a bit rude on a Sunday, but a clut just means a, a color lookup table. So each of those colors that you see in that table have got their own value. So starting with zero, zero, which is black at the bottom, to F and F, which is white. So it's 256 potential colors. And the danger with that, if you ever try to mix two GIFs together, you've got a GIF on your editing package and you want to bring another GIF and it comes in with all kinds of strange colors. That's because that lookup table and that example you see in the screen has that set of colors for the numbers. But if you've taken a picture say of at the seaside, and it's all blue sky and blue sea, then most of those little boxes here are going to have numbers that are variations on dark blue and light blue. So you, you can't mix the two of them yeah, immediately. 
But the most important bit about gifts from our point of view is that you have one option to have one of those colours, no colour, just transparent. In other words, when it comes time to print out, all the other colours will, will superimpose on what you've got already, apart from that particular one. If it's that colour, if you have a rectangle of, of you made transparent, then you see right through it, you'll see the image underneath. And we can use that to good effect. There's a couple of examples. The, the image at the top here is the one I first drew. If I want it to be transparent, I simply say, make that background color transparent. And all of a sudden, you can see through. And the same down here, that's what, what I got from the internet with a white in a white box. I simply said, make that white background transparent. And now I've got a box here, a circle here that can superimpose. You can see it there, but you can see underneath there's no white border anymore. And that can be very handy when we want to superimpose our own like legends and, and information onto an existing image. More importantly, more commonly, I should say, maybe from our editing, we want to do things like cropping and resizing. Take that example above my head. That's a picture of the desk camera pointing down at the surface. I don't need all of that you see in the picture. I just want a subset so I can crop it. So the picture on the left here, I've just cropped around the piece I want to keep and take away the rest. If I need to resize it, I can, but it's too dark to be useful. And I can then change the brightness and contrast. So what we have here is a larger, dull image becomes a more uh, readable, more focused, brighter, smaller image. So you don't have to worry now about when you're taking pictures to get it exactly framed. You can be further back in the knowledge. You can take away the extraneous stuff. And general cleaning up. When I'm looking at stuff, uh, I say to you, look, here's what you can buy on eBay. The larger piece above me is a typical advert on eBay, which contains a lot more information than we need and also takes up more acreage. So what I can do, I can go into my graphics package and simply move stuff around so you only see the bits that matter. Yes, there's a description of the product, there's a picture of the product, there's a price, and it's free postage. And all the other stuff I've got here is extraneous, and you can concentrate just on the important elements. So we can clean up using an editing package to keep the focus of the, the person that's watching on what you want them to see. Videos, once again, you've probably got all that equipment or one of these at least at home. You have an ordinary stills camera and most of them will also take videos. Webcams can, the software can be used to, to extract an image or a video clip using it. Or as you know, everybody uses phones nowadays to take selfies and video clips of themselves. So it's quite easy for members to show part of their layout or some animation or whatever by taking a video of it. You can also put a question mark against websites. You, sometimes you might want to capture all or part of a video you saw on a website. The question mark's there because you've got to take into account once again uh, copyright in terms of music or if you think they're stealing their, their advertising. There's also screen recording. What I mean by that, you can capture what you're doing. So if, if I wanted to show you how I do something, like I showed you earlier on how to use the clipping tool. I recorded that image or that video clip. 
And this, last week, Chick spoke about Win Plus G to get the, the game bar up to let you record. So that's an option. And iPhone, which is free on the internet, again, you can download for free. I find a bit more useful because you can see there, you've got options, but do you want to show, capture only a window of what you're doing at any one time or a region or a whole screen? You can decide whether you want to have the webcam on at the same time. So what you're looking at right now, gents, could be a recording. No, it's me. But it could be a recording, which would simply be uh, what you're seeing just now would be used in, in iPhone to record both the content of what's going on here and, and include me if I click webcam to be on. So you can show activities. Here I'm doing, here's, here's how I cut and paste, or here's how I do programming, whatever. You can record it. And sometimes I do that because I'm never sure whether it'll work all right in the night. As you know, it's one of those laws that if you try to show something, it doesn't work on the day, and it worked half an hour before you, you had the Zoom session. So it may be worth recording something like that. We won't go into other features about composition, lighting, and so on, because that's a whole, whole subject in itself, how to get the best out of that, and editing we're covering. Uh, a bit later. And then we come to the next bit of content, which is putting it all together, getting all the images, adding text where you need it, bullet points where you need it, and putting together in a fashion that logically takes the, the members through what you're trying to get over. You can include videos, you can include animations. If uh, under certain circumstances, if you do if you do it in share screen, it works. But if you do it sharing the screen as a virtual background, then it can't handle videos and it can't handle uh, animations. It's just something you need to know. To create the presentations, I've only got one slide about this because it's something you've got to learn. It's not hard to learn. Most folk use PowerPoint, which is the one just immediately above me. But PowerPoint, although it's very, very well known, and people have died with death by, by PowerPoint, they tell me, but it's not free. If you want to, there's others that are free. Open Office, Impress, Google Slides, which I'm showing there in the second image, Prezi, and so on. There's a whole number of free presentation uh, applications that you can download and use to create presentations. It's not the hardest thing in the world. All you have to do is create lots and lots of little frames and then pop in the text that you want or pop in the images that you want. So that's the content of a, a presentation. If you need a, a hand with it, we're here to help. The next thing is what happens during one of these or the preparation prior to doing one of these Zoom sessions. We've got the content already. How are we going to get it over to the members? So if I disappear myself again for a moment. Here's the tour of the studio. The other present a cup of coffee in the left, obviously. That's a typical setup. The green screen behind me. The desk camera looking down the way. The camera that I'm looking at right now. And three screens for the various parts of the content. I usually need three because the middle one is where I, I uh, see the, the final result or I'm seeing all of you in, in, the, in small windows. The left-hand side screen I normally use for the PowerPoint itself that I'm going to be using. 
and the right hand screen I normally use for either uh, the other software I'm coming to shortly or handling um, participants. And you'll see down here, I can control it with a keyboard or a mouse, or I can step through with an infrared pen, or I can use a little nano that does it for me. So that's a, a typical setup. Also use my, my desk behind me when I want to show multiple things at one time. So I've got a close up view, which is the desk view. I've then got the person view, the head and shoulders view, and then I've got another camera for, in this example, I want to show a power supply and a meter and some equipment, which wouldn't fit in the desk view and would be too far away otherwise. So I normally work with uh, three cameras. A couple of weeks ago, you probably saw Chick and I doing a joint presentation on meters. And that was the setup. A couple of chairs there for Martin and Jeff. The three set up and the three cameras and all the gear sitting there. Uh, and the fan, the good old days when it's too hot. Right, that brings me to the, the green screen. You don't, you, why do you want a green screen? Well, take that picture as an example. It's, uh, it's too fussy. I'd be trying to talk to you there and you're busy saying, I wonder what that picture there, that tram car is. I wonder who's in that picture up in the wall there. What's that he's got in the desk? You're too busy, there's too many distractions. So a green screen can do two things. One is to take away all those distractions. The other is to add extra background content that I'm doing just now. So you don't have to have a green screen. You have that option in the, when you're sharing the screen to, not, to tell it you don't have a green screen and still have a background, but as you can see above me, whoop, above me, all the artifacts around the hand. And when you move, you'll see spaces around your face and so on. It's not, in no means precise. So the green screen is handy. There's the green screen. This sits behind me. That's behind the green screen. Big lumps of wood to hold the green screen up and then dismantle it after today. And the result is, well, what should I say? It's pretty cheap. It's only about seven quid for that size that's behind me. 10 feet by whatever it is, five feet. And that's the result. You can see a, a much cleaner outline now. And if I move my head in that picture, you'd have no artifacts all around me. And that's what happened yesterday at the Olympics. I don't know if you spotted it, there's a piece. All during the Olympics, they're trying to pretend they were sitting in a studio in Tokyo, with Tokyo wall behind them. And then one of the cameras failed to do the green screen and you saw they were sitting in the studio with a great big green screen all the way around them. So they made a little boo-boo there. I thought so. That was only yesterday. Anyway, what are the, what are the screen options? Well, the, the most common one is to click the button at the bottom that says share screen. And that lets you share whatever's on your screen, images, videos, PowerPoint, like your live websites, everything. Right? But there's no webcam content. You're only seeing what's on one of your screens. And that's fine. In a lot of cases, you don't need to have a, like eye contact. If you're doing a little presentation just for five or 10 minutes, that's fine. For, for longer ones, for ones that are going to last an hour, people get tired just looking at a screen without any real person there. So the other option is to have camera contents, not just screen contents. And head and shoulders, like I've seen just now, is the most common uh, version of that, but there are uh, others. Yes, when you hit the share screen button at the bottom of your, of your screen, that's the options you're presented. 
any windows that you happen to have currently open, you can choose that as the one you want to share. If you had only two other windows open, you have two options. If you had 20, you have 20 options. And you can decide to share whatever the content is. If it includes video, you can click to share the sound as well of that video. And that's a standard way of showing just ordinary screen content without uh, the head and shoulders. Another way of showing camera content, still head and shoulders, is to go in to the options for Zoom, go to background and filters, and choose a virtual background. In this case, I've got the Merg logo that I created earlier. It's a static background in this case, but you have the option to include video clips. In fact, it comes with a couple. The first two you see there are ones that come with Zoom. Down at the beach and watching the Aurora Borealis, I think that one is. But you can include your own images that you see here from previous uh, Zoom sessions. As long as the images are JPEG, like I mentioned earlier, as long as the video clips are MP4s. You can't put an AVI as a virtual background. You can't put a GIF as a virtual background. But with those limitations, you're able to do much that I'm showing you right now. If you want PowerPoint as a virtual background, then you still go into Share, but this time you would pick Advanced, and then you pick, you want PowerPoint as your virtual background and you pick which PowerPoint you want and click share. From then on, whatever's in your PowerPoint, you can walk your way through each slide one at a time and have yourself in the screen. You've seen Chick and I and others doing that many times. Right. There's not a lot to say here about on the day itself. We have to allow sharing so other people can show what they've got. We ask people to go into speaker view so you only see what the presenter's presenting, commonly with a co-host, somebody else who can take on the task of uh, letting people in if the speaker's busy speaking and also keeping an eye on the chat if somebody asks questions that the speaker hasn't time to, to look at. And of course, to record it. It records it, by the way, as I said there, as an MP4 for future use. And then you just pick which camera you've got. As you can see, I've got the usual webcams, I've got the droid cam, and I've got the virtual cam that I'll come to in a minute. And then you pick which microphone you're using and so on. You may not have all these options yourself at home, but you pick which ones you want to use during that presentation. And you're good to go. Now, another excellent product, in my opinion, and free, which is even better, OBS Studio. You'll be glad to hear that it comes in Windows and Mac versions and Linux versions. So those people who grump every week that they're Windows-centric can use OBS Studio. And what does it do? Well, let's just look at, that's the normal setup. You connect your mic, which can be built into your laptop, or you have a separate mic, as I've got. You've got screen content, which could be sharing, or it could be a PowerPoint presentation. And then you have the option to pick which camera you want to use. I've got a little arrow there because you can only pick, if you get more than one camera, you can only have one at a time. And that's fine. Quite a lot of the times you're talking to the person and then he's going to show you something on the desk. So you can switch between the desk camera and the head and shoulders camera. They can't normally show both at the same time in a standard Zoom setup. So what you do is you take all your inputs, put them into the Zoom application software, and that then goes out through the PC to the world. So what does it the other one do, 
the OBS Studio has got a mixing desk as well and software. So instead of putting all your elements into Zoom, you put all your elements into OBS Studio and then feed that as one output into the Zoom application. And that means you can mix more than one screen content. It means you can mix more than one video content at the same time. And you can possibly see that working. So it's not a case of which camera do you want. You can have two at the same time. It's not a case of which screen content you want. You can have two at the same time. And that's the software. What you do is, down at the bottom here, you create what they call scenes. So there's one for close-up. And when I do that, it's only got the main camera. So I've blown it up so you can see it. I've called it scene. And the, the elements that are used here are only the main camera. Nothing fancy there yet. I created another scene called desk and I've decided to use the desk camera for that. I've also decided to use display capture. What does that mean? Well, there you are. If you wanted to superimpose something on it, then what we've got now is the desk camera still, but if we wanted to, we could have anything superimposed here. Handily, again, I've got this as uh, you can see through it. Yeah, I've, I've set the transparency so you can see right through it, which is quite handy. You can then have legends everywhere you want on this image. So I'm mixing more than uh, one source here. Or I can go further. If I call this one scene, I've got the microphone, the main camera, and the display. So I've decided to mix PowerPoint as a, as a content and my camera as a content, which is what you're looking at um, from me at the moment. I'm using OBS Studio right now. You can go further again. There's an example where I've modified the scene to have two cameras, a close-up camera, in other words, my desk camera, and a main camera, which is me, and the display. And that lets me, for example, talk to you here about what I'm trying to do, and I'm trying to explain a bit of programming, and you can see the results on that screen. So I've managed to mix two cameras and screen content. Or I could have four different windows. So I've got lots of control over what's actually happening if I use OBS Studio. And then, ah, it's now three o'clock and or half three and everybody's gone. What do we do afterwards? Because people expect then if they've missed the session to have, can I get a recording of that? Or oh, that was really good, but could you remind me, you know, uh, how Chick did all these intricate things? Could, could I see the, the image of it? So it either goes on the website eventually, or sometimes I'll send it to people individually if they, if they request it. So I have to convert these MP4s into some usable uh, fashion. As I said, Zoom creates an MP4. And then you've got various options again, the, the software of your choice. If you want it free, you can use the one that comes with Windows called Movie Maker. Or there's a shareware one called OpenShot. There's a commercial one called Premiere Pro which are three commonly used uh, applications. Again, if you want to use the built-in video editor, you go into the search box and type video editor and up it comes, and that's what it looks like. It's basic, you can do lots of things. You can trim a piece, you can split a video into sections, you can add text. It does a lot of the basic things without uh, any real fuss. Or oh, this is the open shot. 
don't know if you remember, I did a video edit. Keith supplied me a whole bunch of video clips from his layout. And I stitched them together and added some captions and so on. Uh, and it then went on to our own local website, but it also went on to the national website in their demonstration area. And that was all done with OpenShot. We're able to stitch things together. We're able to blend them between one shot and another. We're able to do editing of mistakes, which I'll come to in a second. And there's the same one being done in Adobe Premiere Pro. I don't know if the, the picture is clear enough for you to, to read, but you, you have the ability along the top to edit the type, what they call the timeline. You just drag your MP4 in here. And the top line is the video content, and the bottom piece here is the audio content. So you can see whoever's talking, you can see the, the audio. So I can edit it, which includes things like trimming. There's a razor blade symbol there. I can go in and trim pieces. I can then go into uh, effects up the top here, and I can then blend between. So it'll, the picture will fade out and fade in between individual scenes if I wanted to. Well, in this case, I've got the audio option um, selected. And that window appears with all the options. And one of them is to mute. So if I wanted to mute that section there, I just highlight it, come along here, click on the mute button, and you won't hear that. It's very handy when people cough or other mistakes. Here's an example. You can see just how many edits have been. Every time you see a black vertical line there, I've made some intervention, either cutting something out or, or um, muting something. So for every hour of video that's created in Zoom, there are many hours just spent cleaning it up. First of all, I do top and tail. In other words, there's a, a bit before the, the main thing starts that we don't want to include. And given the, the length of some of these videos, we don't normally produce or include rather the discussion. We only have the presentation. So we then top and tail, cut off the two ends, just keep the bit we want. I've then got to create a title page before I add it onto the video describing what the content is, and then a, a similar one like that that doesn't have any wording here as a kind of a credit at the end. I put this bit in because a lot of the editing is ums and ers. People hesitate. Oh, there's a thing we can do, um, and we all do it. And the reason I've got that there is to, to reassure people who have never done it before that we all make mistakes. This particular count that I did was a piece that involved Keith and Chick and myself. And it turned out that we all had the same um rate per minute as each other. There seemed to be a, a universal factor. The dithers were things like when you forget something or you say the wrong word and correct yourself. Or today, when a couple of people came in in the middle of talking, I can cut that piece out, all kind of mistakes. Or sometimes you click a button intending to go to the next slide and you go to two slides and you go back to maybe a mistake, you can cut all these mistakes out. And I put in this bit about the Hollywood, uh, Hollywood, Hollywood presiding officer. That was when she, was doing an acceptance speech. And he's a professional, and you can see he still made lots of ums and airs in a four-minute period. So don't feel that you know, your addiction isn't up to it. The other thing I've got to do with the video is to sometimes change the sound levels. If I, uh, apart from muting, that is, if something has become too... Uh, quiet, I can raise the level so it's audible for the members. 
And then there's the various fades I mentioned and video transitions. So there's lots of editing at the end once the Zoom session is over to have content for the members to, to keep. If you haven't got it and you use video, well, I would recommend this bit of software. Again, it's, it's a free version, that's what I use. And you simply drop in the video you, you suddenly got from Zoom. And depending the resolution, you may have quite a large, in that case, you can see, well, if you can see from there, it's 3840 by 2160, very high resolution uh, video clip that I uh, recorded. You don't need all that. So I pull it in, drop it in, decide to convert it. But before I do that, I say, just make it the normal HD, 1920 by 1080. If I wanted to, to save storage space, I could make it even smaller, but there's no point. I can then decide whether the quality is normal or higher or lower. Pick all my various options. I can even decide here what kind of output I'm having. I'm keeping it at MP4, but I might decide to make it uh, a clip that would be handier for YouTube or, or uh, some of these uh, other media platforms if they've got specific video uh, requirements. And then if you're ready, you simply click Convert Now. And the result for the one I showed you earlier, the little video clip I showed you earlier about the, the snipping tool, remember that video? It was recorded at 77 megs. And after being processed to HD and normal, it dropped to what? Almost a fifth of its size. Almost a fifth. So I think that's a product that's worth looking at if you're doing video a lot or you want to store family videos or whatever. And lastly, the video editor needn't be just for editing uh, Zoom footage, you can create footage for Zoom sessions. At one of the future meetings, either next Sunday or the one after, uh, Keith and I will be showing this video clip and how we did it. But I'll leave you in the meantime just showing that clip. <laughs> Now that's a, a twist on the, the discussion we had in the past about the camera being mounted in the front. We thought to try and get a cab view. We've also got another view if, if you were sitting in a passenger coach looking out the window, now there's an angled view. And we'll discuss how we did it and we'll discuss the software that allowed us to do that at one of the future meetings for, for short of time just now. And that's where I'm at, um, folks. Are there any questions that people want to ask?